Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. Come, let us worship God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We God the Spirit and the truth. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now turn to a insert in our bulletins and sing our first hymn this morning. I know that my Redeemer lives. Please be seated. As I was preparing for the baptismal this morning, a couple of people observed, it seems like we're having these once a week. Praise the Lord. 
Glory, alleluia, that the Lord has blessed this church and our people with such a wonderful, wonderful um, number of baptisms, a number of bringing children into his covenant, that they too will draw near to him. So we move to the baptism of Elsie this morning. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus Christ and sure of his presence with us, we baptize those whom he has called to be his own. And Jesus Christ, God, has promised to forgive our sins and has joined us together in the family of faith, which is his church. He has delivered us from darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And Jesus Christ, God, has promised to be our father and to welcome us as brothers and sisters of Christ. Know that the promises of God are for you. By baptism, God puts his sign on you to show that you belong to him and gives you the Holy Spirit as a guarantee that, sharing Christ's reconciling work, you also share in this victory, that dying with Christ to sin, you will be raised with him to new life. Samuel and Hannah, in presenting Elsie for baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus Christ, and you show that you want Elsie to study and know him, to love and fear him, and to serve and obey him as his chosen disciple. Please confess your faith by answering the following questions this morning. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Do you trust in him only? Do you intend for Elsie to be his disciple by obeying his commandments and showing his love? We do. Amen. The congregation, please stand. <clears throat> Our Lord Jesus Christ sought us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of Tri-City Covenant Church, promise to tell Elsie the good news of the gospel? to help her know all that Christ commands, and by your fellowship, to strengthen her family ties with the household of God. We do. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy faithfulness promised in this sacrament, and for the hope that we have in thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. As we baptize with water, baptize us with thy Holy Spirit, so that what we think may be thy thoughts, what we say may be thy word, and what we do may be thy works. By thy power may we be made one with Christ our Lord in common faith and purpose. O God, who hath called us from death unto life, we give ourselves to thee, and with thy church throughout all the ages, we thank thee for thy saving grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Come a little closer. <laughs> Elsie Florence West, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we receive Elsie into the congregation of Christ's flock. Hereafter, she shall not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified and to faithfully fight under his banner against sin the world, and the devil, and continue to Christ's faithful soldier and servant until her life's end. Amen. 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 Tri-City Covenant Church, I present unto you the newest member of Christ's kingdom, Elsie Florence West. Let us pray. Almighty God, 
giver of life. Thou hast called us by name and pledged to each of us thy faithful love. We pray for thy daughter Elsie. Watch over her. Guide her as she grows in the faith. Give her a quick concern for neighbors. Help her to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, who was baptized thy son and servant, and is our risen Lord. God of grace, we pray for these parents, Samuel and Hannah. Help them to know thee, to love with thy love, to teach thy truth and tell the story of Jesus to their daughter, that thy word may be heard throughout the earth. Most gracious God, we pray for thy church. Bring about the plans for us, for us that thou hast promised in Jesus Christ our Lord. Remind us of the promises given in our own baptism and renew our trust in thee. Make us strong to obey thy will and to serve thee with joy. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Baptisms give you a whole new perspective on the day. Praise the Lord. Please stand with me. Let us now, brothers and sisters, turn to our Lord and confess our sins. We bow together at the beginning of our confession for 20 seconds of silence as we acknowledge and repent of the number of abortions that are committed in our nation. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us our true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Arise. Lift up your heads and hear the good news. God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us. He has given His only Son to die for you, and for His sake forgives you all your sins. Brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Believe this and rejoice. Amen. Glory be to God on high.
The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. Please be seated. The Acts of the Apostles, Chapter Three. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or well, why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him his perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before hath shown by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. First epistle of John, chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. 
Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Please stand now and join with me in prayer. In the 15th Psalm, we find these inspired words of our Heavenly Father. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Let us pray. Sovereign God, most gracious Father, on this blessed day of the Lord, we, the saints of Tri-City Covenant Church, assembled in company with the universal church and heavenly host in worship, and who would indeed not be, but for our righteous Savior's expiating ministry and service to the church, that which we reverently concede was the condition proceeding to restored communion with you, our most holy God, gather in consequence with joyful thanksgiving. Abiding in your tabernacle, inhabiting your holy hill through Christ our Lord, we again with gratitude in our hearts present to you our petition, recognizing our utter dependence upon your provision for the success of the entrusted conquest. We therefore thank you, most beneficent God, for occasioning the event of Tri-City Christian Academy's auction banquet last evening. Thank you for all the souls that participated in the event and for the proceeds procured in support of the school ministry. We are especially thankful for the profound blessing of Christian fellowship and community on full display last evening. That which we recognize is both the cause and effect of this glory ministry conceived by our Lord and necessarily reliant upon his perfecting grace. In view of this almighty God, we ask that you would gloriously perpetuate the work of Tri-City Christian Academy, rendering her an, an, an immovable, uncompromising force even until the end of time. And by our Lord's ministry through her, in conjunction with the wider church, might prove a luminescent beacon in the darkness, increasingly displacing the same through her maturing witness of both declaring and devotedly living out the implications of your son's enthronement. To this most holy end, and as our Lord propagates the righteousness intrinsic to him alone throughout his global kingdom, if it please you, O glory king, inculcate in all those who encounter the ministry of Tri-City Christian Academy in whatever capacity, the blessed virtues beautifully celebrated by the psalmist, indeed those inerrantly exemplified in our Lord, so that all of us, in following in his train, might be enabled to ourselves walk uprightly, work righteousness, and speak the truth in our hearts. Ever merciful God, let it be so according to your transcendent word, for we ask it upon the righteous merit of the word personified, his eminence Jesus the Christ, our Redeemer Lord, who himself is making all things new. Amen. Amen. Let us now join in singing Psalm 89. We'll be singing verses 8 through 14.
Amen. The Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 24. Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to your Christ. Let us now turn to page six in our worship hymnals and together profess our faith by singing together the Nicene Creed. Christian, what do you believe? Please be seated. Our sermon today is entitled, Hannah's Prayer and Song. And during the baptism of Elsie, I couldn't help but wonder could God have somehow planned this particular scripture to be our text scripture today 
with Hannah being the mom. And then somehow Samuel being the husband, they're in the story too. The humanists would say, just coincidence, just coincidence. But I sometimes think that the world is more than we know. And sometimes there's more happening than we're aware of in our day-to-day -day life. Once again, I have to tell you, I'm impressed with your singing. It's, uh, Lewis Schuller once told us, when we sing to the glory of God, it should sound, when you're in the front, it should sound like a freight train. And you are sounding more and more like a freight train. One of the things I'm very happy about at Tri-City Christian Academy is that we have an emphasis on worship, an emphasis on singing. And you know, that's really not a tangential or distant part of eternity. I think we have a view that sometimes schooling, the important thing is, you know, algebra, English grammar, history, need a little bit of that. Oh, science, don't forget science. We got to get a good job. We got to get our kids set to get a good job someday so they can make money and uh, get food and pay taxes. I submit that that's a very limited view of what we're doing when we educate children. What are we doing? I think we're preparing them to worship the king throughout all eternity. That's our main job, I think. I think when Jesus looks down at schools and home schools, he wants to know, is that child, my child, being prepared to stand before my throne and give me praise and glory through the endless ages of eternity? I had a, a sad meeting, I guess, one day. This is years ago. A very dear lady that had her kids in our school uh, kindergarten through grade eight, two, two boys. They were a great, great family. But she decided to take them to another school starting at the ninth grade. They were transferring out of here. And, and she, she was really part of our operation. She, she was, worked in the cafeteria and everything. She was a great person, very supportive. And the two boys were, were leaving to go to another school for the ninth grade. And she, was, she felt obligated to meet with me and tell me about it and tell me why. And, and I, you know, it was sad, but I listened and wished them well. And she, but she made one statement that I'll never forget. She said, when it comes to worship, when it comes to chapel, when it comes to your matin service, nobody does that better than you. I took that as a compliment in the midst of a sad conversation. Nobody does it better than you. I'll take that to the grave. Thank you. We have our problems. We have our deficiencies. But at least we get a compliment on something like that. And if you've ever been here for uh, one of our combined chapels, which we have about five times a year, the children from Rocky Hill come over here in buses, and we have a combined chapel, you'll know what I'm talking about. I, I think I could tell you confidently, you've never, if you haven't seen that, you haven't been there, You've never experienced anything like it. Please come next time we gather together. It'll be Ascension Day out on the hill. Peter Lightheart wrote a book one time called From Silence to Song. And in that book, he talked about the militant character of the church's music. He said that in the early days of the church, back in Old Testament Israel, the Levites would carry God's ark into battle, as they did in Jericho, and it would be on their shoulders with staves, and they marched, marched around the city seven times. You know the story. That was the job of the Levites, to carry the ark of God, to carry his throne, to carry his name into battle. And then years went by. Israel got settled in the land conquest, uh, the ark got a home, a permanent place. First a tabernacle, a tent at Shiloh, but then it got moved to Jerusalem and was moved into the temple. Okay, the Levites are just out of a job. 
or are they? What did the Levites begin to do? And from silence to song unpacks the idea that they had a new job, but it was the same job. They had a new job now that they were musicians. They were to play music. They were to teach the congregation music and how to sing to the glory of God. It's a different job, but it's the same job. As a matter of fact, it's an enhanced version of the first job. In the first job, the Levites would carry God's name into battle. Hmm, I get it. The second job, the Levites would carry God's name into battle, but this time it was real battle. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're fighting uh, principalities and powers, spiritual forces in high places. That's what we're doing now. That's what we do when we assemble. We're the new Levites. We're carrying God's name. We're carrying his throne. We're carrying his ark into battle. That's why church worship should be militant in character. Oh, there's a time for a place for the tender, emotional, reflective songs. There's a time for that. Pastor Clark used to call them the I, my songs. Pretty good description. That doesn't mean they're bad. Nothing wrong with singing, I come to the garden alone in the morning. Jesus talks to me. I like that. But it's not for worship. Because worship, we have an enemy out there. We have ground to conquer. We have a job to do. And it's a very serious job. I think sometimes men, especially, um, don't want to participate in singing as much as they should because of a feminist influence on church music sometimes. Did I say women were bad? No, I like them. They're fine. It's just that the music in the character has become emotional and personal and individualistic to a fault. I think sometimes when it says men don't go to church anymore, I think sometimes that's the reason. I can't, I can't go and sing that stuff. There's a funny video of Clint Eastwood talking about church music. You mean men sing this? <laughs> In church? Yeah, uh, sadly that's the case. But we can get past this, we can get out of this, we can get back to the old onward Christian soldiers type stuff. Hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voices, loud your anthem, anthems raise. That's what we do. That's the purpose of our gathering and worship. It's spiritual warfare going on here. And too often we have to fight against this real men don't sing. You'll find a lot of men just, I might listen, I might stand out of respect for the process, but I'm not going to give my heart. Singing is enhanced speech. That's what singing is. And God wants the whole man. He wants the whole heart. Real men do sing. I'm happy to be part of this church where aggressive psalm singing, robust, is part of the program. Warlike song. We're going to take ground. That's what I like in my church music, worship music. You know, if you think about it, where can you go today, think of your life, all your associations, your job, your church, where can you go today where you can just sing? We live in an age that's been affected by the Enlightenment and there's a strong dose of stoicism in our culture. Stoicism is like... Uh, I'm indifferent to pleasure and pain. Doesn't mean anything to me. You can cut my head off or you can give me a million dollars. Same emotion. That's not Christian. That's stoicism. Singing is enhanced speech. Our text scripture today is Hannah's song. It's about Hannah and it's about a song. 1 Samuel 2, 1 through 10. Hear the words of God. (laughs) 
And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There was none holy as the Lord, for there was none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceedingly proudly. Let no arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty man are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven. And she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are your people, and you are our God. Feed us with your word today. Renew us and move upon our hearts by dispatching your Holy Spirit to this, your blood-bought and most humble and needy congregation. We make these requests in the name of Christ, our God and King. Amen. It's interesting in Hannah's song how she ended it, exalt the horn of his anointed. Exalt the horn. Okay, we had a, in our psalm it had a verse like that too. God's covenant people, their horn is exalted. The only thing I'm going to say about a horn is it's not a, uh, primarily a defensive part of an animal. Metaphorically, we're talking about offense. Animals have horns to go onto the attack with. Now, I know the best defense is a good offense. But we're talking about offense here. We're talking about the kingdom advancing. That's what animals that have horns do. They take ground, they take territory. Most of us will remember the story of the barren woman, Hannah. She prayed to God that uh, she would be delivered from the condition of barrenness. Um, her adversary, her, the other wife in this polygamous marriage, Penina, and her adversary also provo provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. You can imagine the dialogue that took place in the household. Peninnah had several children. Hannah had none. It's kind of similar to the uh, situation with Sarah and Hagar. Sarah had to endure a lot of grief because of the taunting from Hagar, it was shameful. I'm barren. I have no children. Elkanah, Hannah's husband, I get a kick out of this. Am I not better to thee than ten sons? <sighs> I think he needed to attend male sensitivity school. <laughs> he just didn't get it. There's a part of a woman that is so as Kipling says, armed and engined for bearing children that no, okay, no, you might be a great guy, but you're not the same as bearing a child. You're not the same. There's an emptiness in Hannah, and she's being tormented and taunted above this. To make things worse, while Hannah prayed for deliverance by God, um, Eli, the priest, saw her praying, 
And he was so blind, literally and spiritually, that he thought she was drunk. Eli's blindness was a picture or a type of Israel's blindness. False accusation. Eli talking to Hannah, saying, you're drunk, woman. You know, it's uh, not that much different with the Lord Jesus Christ. He had to deal with false accusation. You're a wine bibber, and you eat with sinners. You're a drunkard. You know, it, Philippians 3.10 says, Oh, that I may know him, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. You know, when you suffer false accusations as a Christian, you're just following the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're part of the family story. We could say it goes with the territory. God heard Hannah's prayer. The name Samuel means heard by God. I like the name Samuel. We have a Samuel in, in, in here. We have Sam DeRoche. We have uh, Sam West. Probably some others that I forgot. I got a new guy named Samuel in my family. Samuel, heard by God. And you know, there's a principle that's found throughout Scripture. It started with Isaac, and it continued through Samuel. He who laughs last, laughs best. You ever heard that before? Where did that come from? That is the story of Scripture. Oh, it's a trite little saying. We, we say it offhandedly today. He who laughs last, laughs best. That's the story of redemptive history, folks. Sometimes it's phrased, he who laughs last, lasts longest. I like that. We're going to laugh throughout the endless ages of eternity. Yes, we start off being barren, but then God makes us fruitful. You know, we might say that Hannah or even Jesus gets the last laugh also. We're people of the last laugh. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And then the next verse, and they slew a bullock, another bullock, and brought the child to Eli. Now, most of us are not from an agricultural type background. I'm only a little bit of my background is in, on farming. But a bullock, you know, that's not cheap. You take one of those big old critters full of meat and you sacrifice it and give it to the Lord, you're putting some skin in the game, figuratively speaking. That's, we tend to read that as, oh yeah, they gave a bullock. Oh, they gave two bullocks or three bullocks. Hey. They were giving a serious offering for the blessing that that family had enjoyed by having that son. I submit to you that the Bible commands us to give tithes. That's easy. That's a tenth, right? And offerings. I've talked about this before. I always get... Uh, we used to have a guy that would do his tithe. He, this is long ago. He's not here now. I'm not, I'm not going to slander his name or anything like that. But he, he would put his tithe in. It was, it was kind of neat. Every week, like, he would have a tithe, $18.27. All right? He must have, <laughs> he must have made like a, what, what would the 10, 10 of that be? 180 bucks that week. And, and, and something like that. I can't even do the math up here. But some, and then other weeks it might be, he might have had a good week. $32.14. Man, that guy's right on the penny to the tithe. He's complying with the law of God. boy, good job. But <laughs> it does say end offerings. Offerings were voluntary expressions of gratitude, of worship. And we were to bring offerings as well. I'm just going to say this uh, personal note. You don't have to do anything with it yourself. But since God has started to bless my family abundantly, in the last 
before, I can't even keep track of the math. Uh, we, we've had a whole bunch of children born in our family. We've got one more on the way. Maybe even more than that, who knows? Um, I've developed a, a pattern of when a child is brought to the baptismal waters, I put in an extra offering. Now, above the tithe, I still give my $18.14, but I put an offering as well. I think it's right to do. I would just ask that you think about that a little bit. But this, uh, this concept of offerings today, it seems strange to us. Hey, when I say by works, you know what I mean? I know. But out of gratitude, we obey the scriptures. Hannah's song was like a Magnificat, very similar to the song of Mary. Both the barren women and the virgin rejoiced that the Lord was throwing down the high and lifting up the low. Both women celebrated the rebirth of God's people that would take place when arrogant priests and scribes were thrown down and the house of Israel was set on new pillars. There's more going on than just personal individual vindication. God overcoming the barren womb. It's more than Hannah dealing with Penina. See, look, I'm pregnant now. <laughs> There's a cosmic dance going on here. These pregnancies that these women had, Hannah and Mary, are an outworking of the promise, the promise of Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman shall defeat the seed of the serpent. And we, when we have children, we are also part of that. Satan wanted to destroy Jesus even before he was born. He wasn't too happy about Samuel coming into the world, but he detests the birth of children. And he's a bloodthirsty foe, and he's not fooling around. And we do our part when we, in obedience to God, have families. You women, you women that are pregnant now and that have, you know, brought children to this baptismal font in, in recent months, Pastor Harold was talking about, it seems like we're have, having one of these all the time. Yeah, that's the way it should be. That's the way life in the covenant is. It's prospering. It's flourishing. It's new life. What we're doing is bringing more seeds of the woman, covenant children, into the world to do battle against our adversary. Hannah, as a type of Mary, knew the birth of her child was far more than her personal vindication and blessing. Oh, it was that, but it was far more than that. She knew that when God started opening barren wombs, he was beginning to act for his people. Our church has been blessed recently. It's an amazing thing that God is doing here, and we need to rejoice and listen to his voice to see that we can be obedient to bringing these children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord properly. That's our job. As arrows of a mighty man, so are children. They're like a quiver. They're attack vessels, you know, like the horn. Arrows. Nobody's ever taken an arrow to defend themselves. At least I don't think they have. They're attack mechanisms. And the Bible uses that metaphor. My hat is off to all of you ladies that have children. We've had a few. And every time, I, as I stand there, it never gets old. I'm, I'm overwhelmed by God's goodness, but also by my wife's sacrifice, that she would do that, to bring the children into the world. And I'm always struck with this feeling that when I hold that new kid, Lord, I understand that this is your child, and he's part of your army, and my job is to facilitate his growth in your army. I don't mean to leave you guys out of it. You do some, you do, you help some too. <laughs>
And I'm talking about working two jobs. I'm talking about getting up at four in the morning and working 16 hour days. I'm talking about going to work when you're sick. I'm talking about taking your responsibility like a man. That's our job, guys. Notice the parallels between Hannah's song and the Magnificat. I had a, I had a parent one time, this is years ago, you don't know him either. But he, we were just starting to move into liturgical worship, so we had the Magnificat, you know, Mary's song, My Soul Doth Magnify the Lord. And uh, he called me up. He said, you're, you're turning into Catholics. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're singing that, that song about that Mary, uh, some song about Mary. My, my kid comes home and complains. <laughs> Kids are famous at that. It, and they don't even care. It's what they, what they can do. Ah, I know. I can press a button to make my parents hate the teacher. <clears throat> Daddy, I was troubled. I, they, they're talking all about Mary at that school. I told the guy, I said, well, you know, it's right out of the Bible. No, it isn't. Hmm. Uh, no, it, it's actually in the Bible. It's uh, right there in Luke chapter 1. No, it isn't. Uh, we're going nowhere fast. <laughs> my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. Is this Mary or is this Hannah? It's a similar song. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats, and hath exalted them of low decree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Man, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm reading something from Hannah or from Mary. The same principle is at stake. The barren womb, and you can't get more barren than a virgin. That's a, that's a very barren womb, although Mary did have children after Jesus. But um, in spite of what the Romans think. But the point is, it's the same thing of bringing life where there was none. You know, when we have children here, um, you might be a, a couple that has to struggle and pray and, I don't know, take vitamins or take your temperature and do the charts. I, I, don't, I don't know how it all works, but you might have a hard time having children. Or you might be one of those couples that if the guy walks into the room, the girl's pregnant. I don't know how it works. <laughs> well, I'll understand when I'm older, I guess. But either way, it's a miracle of God, and it's a cosmic dance. Again, what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is we just got a kid in our house. Yeah, that's, that's part of it. But more than that, the warfare between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent is what's going on. It's what's going on with that little bundle you're carrying. Notice the parallels between the song of Mary, the Magnificat, and the later uh, song, I guess we could say, of, John, uh, of Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation, there's the horn again, for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. It's an old story, folks. Start it in Genesis chapter 3. And God has elaborated upon this story, layer upon layer, until we have the Christ child. And, it doesn't stop there, until we have your children that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. There's a war going on, folks. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hands of our enemies. Some of us are so blind we don't even know we have enemies. But make no mistake, we do and you do. 
out of the hands of our enemies, that we might serve him without fears in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, speaking to John. And thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Notice the warlike militant terms. You, you bearers of children, you are warriors. You're part of the cosmic dance. The Christian church has very correctly sung these beautiful and powerful sections of Holy Scripture throughout our history, in spite of what some of our ignorant, anti-Roman Catholic so-called brethren might say. It's not in the Bible. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. Oh, boy. Another one of the songs given in Scripture is the song of Deborah. And that, again, is part of this cosmic dance. You know, the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent. What is Deborah celebrating in this song? She's celebrating Jael, the woman that drove a tent peg through the head of Sisera. And the song of Deborah ends this way. This is good. This is beautiful. And this is a pattern for us. If your thinking doesn't align with this kind of thinking, change it. Blessed above woman shall Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. He asked water, Sisera, and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter and a lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer she smote Sisera. She smote off his head when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. Hey, the cosmic drama, the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, we shall crush the head, he'll crush our heel. At her feet he bowed down, He fell, he lay down, at her feet he bowed, he fell where he bowed, there he fell down dead. And this part, just follow me. The mother of Sisera, he's got a mom too, right? Sisera, the the evil guy. The mother of Sisera looked out at a window and cried through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Where's Sisera? He ought to be back by about now, right? Why is his chariot so long in coming? She's taunting in the song. Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? Her wise ladies answered her, yea, she returned answer to herself. Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey to every man, a damsel or two? They're probably just taking the loot from the victory of their battle, probably raping a few girls along the way. They'll be along. Sisera will be back. No, he won't. To Sisera, a play of diverse colors, a prey of diverse colors of needlework, of diverse colors of needlework on both sides, meet for the necks of them that take the spoil. This is Deborah talking, triumphant over this victory, triumphant over this woman who crushed the head of this soldier. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. You know, sometimes I, we, we have, I'm in the American Legion, and sometimes we have uh, Veterans Day services and things like that, and we have this guy that plays a bagpipe. And um, wow. He gets in that that little hall. You might have been there for some of these things. When that guy turns that thing on, whoa, it's it's, it's no wonder they conquered the world. Uh, That makes you just want to fight those those bagpipes. It reminds me of the William Wallace uh, scene in Braveheart. And they're playing the bagpipes out after the uh, father is killed. 
And uh, Argyle comes up to Wallace and says, outlawed to tunes on outlawed pipes. It was the same for your daddy and me when our father was killed. Oh. Oh. The Scottish Psalms and the hymns simply do not convey any kind of spirit of neutrality or appeasement. We're not trying to appease the enemy. We're reminded, we are to remind Satan of his defeat. And we do that, we do that, we do that in our songs, in our worship. We, were, we are to remind Satan of his defeat. That's warfare, folks. His past defeat, his present defeat, and his future defeat. Don't appease him. Sometimes I'll joke, somebody coming in, stamping on that serpent head. I'll say, don't wake him up, don't make him mad. I'm only kidding. We're at war, and we want to make him mad. How do we make him mad? We make him mad by obeying the law of the covenant, by having children, by taking dominion of the creation, and by worship, by carrying that throne into battle with our voices. I w I, th this is... I was, uh, when I worked at Pratt & Whitney, I was asked to uh, start a chapter of what they had, the Air Force Association. So I, it was easy, because everybody out there, it was politics and all that. But we, we formed this chapter of the Air Force Association. And my job was to go around when I had time and say, hey, would you, you want to sign up? It's 10 bucks. You, you can be a member of the Air Force Association. They want us to have a chapter here at Pratt & Whitney because the Air Force was one of our customers. Makes sense. So I went around doing all this planned a couple of events, it was great. But I went up to one guy, a coworker, and I said, Tom, would you like to um, join the Air Force Association? <laughs> I'll never forget his answer. No, no, because if I do, they will have my name. And when they come over here, they'll root me out. I said, they who? You know, the Russians. Good grief, are we that backed up against the wall? This was the 1980s. We're, I know the Cold War was going on, but the Russians were not at our doors. Have a little courage. They could find out. That was appeasement. We don't dare want to upset him. Yes, we do. We want to remind him of his defeat. In the Book of Common Prayer, when they do a baptism, their liturgy says, I sign you with the sign of the cross, talking to the, the new child. I sign you with the sign of the cross in token that you should not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified manfully to fight under his banner against sin, the world, and the devil. Manfully. Yeah, that's the generic term. We're Generically, we're men. And women, too. And we're to manfully fight under Christ's banner and continue Christ's faithful soldier and servant until our life's end. <sighs> Much of this is accomplished through song. Tri-City Covenant Church, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Amen. Please stand. Let's turn to page eight in our worship hymnals and together sing the Psalm of Consecration.
Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord God, for this day. We pray, O Lord, that you might accept our offering this day and that your blessing be upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. Please stand. <clears throat> Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, we approach you in the name of Jesus, your only begotten Son and our Savior. Hear and answer our prayers this Lord's day because we bring them to you in his name. We seek your blessing upon Harvest of Praise Church in Rochester, New Hampshire. Bless them, O Lord, for the many years of faithful service to you. Grant them the peace and unity of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would fulfill their gospel callings to the Rochester community. Turn the hearts of those who lead in our civil government towards you, the creator of all things. Be gracious, dear Father, we pray, to the lost in the government who are headed for destruction. Turn them, O Lord, so that they themselves would be saved and that they would enact laws that would agree with your holy law word. Move, O Lord, in a mighty way upon our local, state, and national civil government. Merciful Father, draw near to all those who are presently afflicted with physical or spiritual difficulties this day. Draw near and bring healing, gracious Father, as only you can. We pray specifically for Yolan Clark, Joanne Vatcher, and Marion Walsworth and all others who may be omitted here, but which are known unto you. Heal your people, we pray. Lastly, Almighty God, continue to shape us by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that we might image your Son more and more each day. Grant us the ability to overcome the powers of darkness and the sin that so easily hinders our walk with Christ. Might we be intently focused on pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let it be so, O Lord. We pray these things and whatsoever else you know that we need. In the name of Jesus, who is the risen Christ and who taught us to pray.
Let us now turn to page 10 in our worship hymnals and together we'll sing the Beatitudes of our Lord. As we approach the communion table, let us be encouraged by the word of our Lord. I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Let us pray. Gracious Father, with this bread and wine, we remember the sacrifice made for us by your Son. We believe in his resurrection and await his coming in power to judge the world. We rejoice with him through this great promised feast. Send us your Holy Spirit, who receive this food, may live to the praise of your glory, and receive our inheritance with all your saints and light. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated, and a family representative may receive the communion elements.
Please join with me in giving thanks for the bread of life. Our Father, we give you thanks for the bread of life, your Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his body broken on our tree. Bless this bread that we may be renewed and strengthened in faith to serve you more fully and have the joy and peace promised to us in the life, death, resurrection, and of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Please join with me again in giving thanks for the blood that's been poured out for us. Our Father, we give you thanks for the blood poured out for us to release us from our sins. Bless this wine that we may renew our covenant vows with you through the blood of the everlasting covenant and with your life-giving blood. Cleanse us that we may walk with you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is a New Testament in my blood. This do you often drink it in remembrance of me. Hi, Colin. I guess I'm predictable. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this, your salutary gift, and we beseech you of your mercy to strengthen us through the same gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Ghost, world without end. Amen. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. or Deacon Jake West to come forward this morning. I think he wants to talk a little bit about the work day. And while he's coming, I'll just point out there's just a few things in the bulletin this morning. You see that we have the events coming up in May, and I believe that we're, I think we're missing one, the men's fellowship there, so we'll make sure that gets added this week for May, and then... Um, we also have our uh, wine and cheese fellowship coming up uh, May 5th um, after the service. So if you use your mic microphone, stand right up here, Jake, right in front of everybody. Yay, I get to be mic'd. Um, Workday is this Saturday. Amen. If anyone didn't know that already. Our main focus is going to be spring cleanup. So the property around here, just getting all the sticks and stuff, any windows that need to be washed dirt that needs to be swept, that sort of stuff. And then also we have a 5K coming up on the cross country trail. We'd like to get that cleaned up so they can run without tripping and jumping. Um, but that's gonna be the main focus. If you can help out with that, just let me know. I'll let you know what you need to bring. Um, main cleanup stuff. I think everyone knows what that sort of stuff is. But if you have questions, let me know. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there.
All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Please stand. <clears throat> now we receive the commission of our king. If you would, please, down on your right knee, your head forward, as we are commissioned for our service this week. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Amen. Please stand. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Amen. Let us close our worship this Lord's Day by singing our final hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King. <laughs>